Yeah, so Craig's going to talk a little bit more about the, the usage and the user experience on this uh, approach. <clears throat> I'm a bit shorter, so I'll just put that down. I'm a hobbit. You've come to Middle Earth. Hello, so I'm Craig. I'm, I work with Jennifer at the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, sorry uh, that my presentation today is today. It was supposed to be tomorrow. We changed the schedule. Um, I've just got off a plane from Europe after teaching a whole week of this kind of stuff to a bunch of professionals um, at the University of Oxford, where I do a regular teaching gig around talking about agile software development. So <clears throat> Jennifer's given us a good introduction of what agile is, and I'm going to give you some empirical analysis of why I think you should use agile software development in your work practices. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, my colleagues uh, in Canada, Robert Biddle, uh, Martin Kropp, and Andreas Meyer, who work at two universities uh, in Zurich in the Switzerland area. So we're going to talk about some empirical analysis on some software development methods using Agile, um, primarily just in Switzerland. And at the end of the talk, I've got something for you to do. So um, we'll talk to you about that in a minute. You can go to the webpage uh, there, swissagilestudy.ch, and you can find out more. Um, so just a quick raise of hands. How many of you are software developers in the room? Oh, okay. Software What's that? <laughs> Define software development. We write software. And doesn't yeah. make us software developers. Okay, how many of you write code? Ah. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> how many of you manage software or coding teams? Okay, so there's a few. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about. That's what the study set up to talk about how managers understand Agile and how software developers uh, perceive Agile practices. So I have uh, four different areas that I'm going to talk about um, related to this topic around satisfaction, experience, and culture in Agile development. So I'll talk about satisfaction why people are satisfied with Agile based on what Jennifer was talking about, and then talk about how experience and culture affects how software development teams practice Agile, and then some personal effects on what people personally think about some of the methods within Agile. So we've been doing the study since 2012, and we've been doing a biannual study. Um, I got involved about five years ago, and we do it every two years, and it was just primarily Switzerland. Um, what I tell you about at the end, where we're going with this study, and the idea is that we would send out emails to organizations and ask managers of the organization to uh, uh, fill out the survey, plus people that are in the organization to um, also participate in the study. And the idea is to understand how people are using classic waterfall methods or classic traditional software development that's non-agile and agile. There was 21 questions plus another question around um, personal effects around uh, agile, and we had like scales. I'm not a statistician. I know more of you, I think more of you in this room know more about stats than me. I'm not the stats person on the project, but there's some statistics that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, so it's a joint project with about four universities, um, and we had some funding from Switzerland because they have lots of money. So the survey uh, had just over 300 people complete the survey, about 140 odd at, uh, at companies, and then 165 that actually um, <clears throat> were individuals. Some statistics about, or some numbers about this, the survey itself. Uh, CEOs were 34%. Um, and, and so on, you can see the numbers there. And then in terms of sort, size of organizations, this probably reflects maybe some organizations in the room, but most of them were small, smallish companies, I think just like NIWA, with you know, a thousand people here in this room, uh, some number like that, um, but most of the organizations were 250 less. So we tried to categorize, categorize them somewhat. <clears throat> so these are the research questions because we're scientists, computer scientists, trying to understand software development. So we want to know how does Agile actually methods influence the satisfaction of teams? So while they're actually doing these Agile methods, does it actually make the team more satisfied? And how does, it, how does satisfaction actually correlate to some of the individual practices that Jennifer talked about in the, uh, just previously? And then does that satisfaction actually depend on the influences achieved within the development methods? So some of the business influences, some of the software influences, and some of the technical influences. So if you look at this, uh, slide here, this shows you uh, where people, uh, where they perceive themselves as what type of method that they were using. So here you can see that um, <clears throat> nobody was exclusively doing Agile. Um, most people were doing mostly Agile or both plan-driven plus Agile. So plan-driven was more of the waterfall, more of the traditional style of things that you thought about. But what we did see is that very few people are actually doing just plan-driven. So as we see a momentum of organizations taking on Agile methods, this is becoming um, much more adopted practices outside of software development teams or software organizations, such as organizations like yourself. 
Um, in terms of satisfaction, as you can see, most people are relatively satisfied with the professionals here and the company. So this is a representative of the company that was talking about how they were satisfied with Agile. Um, then we look at some box plots here that show you a bit more detail. And so again, um, similar kind of data, most people are pretty satisfied with doing Agile. And then if we look at the next uh, slide, I will share the slides too, and you can read the paper as well if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> that most people, the professional, uh, so plan-driven professionals, 40% um, are unsatisfied with plan-driven approaches. That's pretty high, right? So if you're doing waterfall methods, people don't like them. That's what that's just saying. But if you are doing agile methods, people are well more satisfied, and that's you know 60% there, or satisfied or very satisfied. So much higher. So the idea of the, the, the only takeaway message from this is you should adopt agile practices, okay, in your organization. How do you do that? Well, that's a long, complicated question, uh, uh, set of uh, things to do. So some of the set, uh, technical practices and agility, um, again, same kind of thing here. Um, you can see um, that the satisfaction versus um, the technical practices. So they're very, they're quite satisfied with agile itself with the satisfaction. And then, um, so these are the like it scales and so on. And then, so, so the, reason, the question was like, why are they, they've said they're satisfied, but why are they satisfied? And so we tried to look at into deep level analysis and look at sort of some of the individual practices around um, the technical components, the collaboration components, and some of the planning uh, components. So Jennifer alluded to each of these different categories in the last section. And so with the technical practices, we have things that were mentioned in the early morning session, where we talked, where some of you were talking about coding this and database this. This is known as like refactoring. This is a very important component within one of the technical practices. Um, we, I heard someone talk about, you know, making sure that the database is clean. So this is like clean code. A new word is uh, DevOps, where you're having the database person running some scripts and another software developer. That's a DevOps role. It's a really important role that's coming along. Um, each, each one of these is, you know, probably an hour long to talk about, so I won't go into detail. Um, so some of the collaboration practices around um, having a dedicated product owner, which is what uh, Jennifer said, um, retrospective and planning meetings, uh, sort of looking back on what actually happened. So groups come around together to discuss what actually happened. And then some of the planning practices around release planning, iteration planning, the next two or three months of work, what you're actually going to do, um, and some other components. But I'm just gonna highlight what were those important practices that actually made teams more satisfied. So um, what's critical here is the ones that were more collaborative practices. So the ones that involve here, this group of things, were the most important things on agile software development. And I suspect in your organizations that you're probably spending more time in technical practices. But what's most important about satisfaction on software development teams are these collaboration practices. And this is the analysis that we did. So the most important practice is this thing called self-organizing team, where you do not have a manager telling you what to do each day. The team figures it out, and that's called self-organizing. And it's not something that you say to your team, hey, team, you've got to be self-organizing, right? <laughs> it's the team figures it out. The team takes ownership of who does which tasks, which uh, development components, and, and so on. The next one, collective code ownership. That means that the whole team buys into the software. So if you run the database, someone else can actually have a discussion about what that database should look like and can write that code. And you stick things, and I heard earlier this morning, people talking about the GitHub, GitLab thing. So all your code goes into one shared repository. That's what's important here. And in terms of planning practices, those are really important. So story mapping, so trying to get a good story of flow of things that actually work. And then short iteration. So what we mean by that is that you actually produce software on a more frequent basis uh, rather than, hey, we're going to produce the software in six months' time or annual basis. That's too slow for some of the customers that you work with. You should be releasing software more frequently. Um, and as we can see is that very few technical practices are even involved here. So software craftsmanship is one where you're looking at um, a professional style of uh, practices. And you know, refactoring is super important, so re changing your code all the time. Um, and acceptance test-driven development. So using testing is, is, is also important. So those are the top 10 practices out of all the, those practices there. But the key one is self-organizing. Um, so that's kind of what I said there. Then some of the agile influences. So um, <clears throat> this is influences that would actually help your software team regardless if it was agile, but we specified them into three different areas. So business influences, 
software influencers and team influencers. And you can kind of see these kinds of things that you're probably familiar with, you know, time to market, project visibility, alignment between goals and so on, delivery, product predictability. Um, and then in terms of software influencers, the quality of the software maintainability, defects, um, and then team influences, how people are actually work together as a team productivity and so on, and stress, which we'll talk about in a second. So the most important one was getting the software to market. That was the, the key, key here. That really reflects back on agile, agile software development, where we're having short releases, getting that software out quickly. So um, Facebook, Google, these big dot coms are releasing software every few minutes, right? And that's the huge change from what we saw with plan-driven development software back in, you know, prior to agile methods being adopted well. Um, handling risk is important as well. And as Jennifer also suggested, managing dis, uh, distributed teams is significantly di difficult these days, um, but there are tools to help that. So those are the things that actually help <coughs> with the analysis, sorry, with um, the influences to make software uh, more effective using agile. Uh, so yeah, I kind of covered that. Um, so uh, one thing we did see though, this, we did some correlation analysis and so this shows you the regression tree. So self-organizing was the number one, collective ownership was number two. What we did find is that there's actually a negative correlation here with retrospective. And so retrospective happens at the end of a short iteration. So two to three weeks or a month, depending on what your cycle happens to be. The aim is to do a review of your code or what you've actually produced. And the Agile says, you should do retrospectives, but our, our empirical data says retrospectives where people didn't actually want to do that on a frequent basis. We need to drill down more into further analysis about that, but we're getting there. Um, cool, so the second uh, area, so that was about satisfaction. This is sort of about um, my Agile, which we ask these personal questions to each of the, the, um, the individual people. And these were the sort of the questions that we were asking them and to give them a like at scale of, uh, sorry, of complete agree, agree, disagree, and completely disagree. And so the questions were, I pay more attention to my technical excellence, my work life balance has improved. So, you know, I suspect everybody in the room, you get to a deadline and you're all cranking out 80 hours a week just to get the code done. Agile talks about sustainable workflow. So the idea is that we're constantly working at a sustainable pace rather than cramming everything at the last minute. And why do we do that? It's because we plan on a much slower pace. Um, other things, releases are nightmare and so on. Um, what are the other ones? I have fun at work, this kind of thing. So the idea with Agile is it actually makes teams more effective. If, it, if you're doing a good job, people are happier. That's what we found. If we look at a couple of things here, so the most important aspect here is I pay more attention to technical excellence. So that's what individuals were doing, but really we found that the collaboration was key here. Um, and so the idea is because we're doing Agile, the technical excellence was uh, improved. Likewise, release was no longer a nightmare. Why? Because we have these new roles called DevOps, we have release managers and, and this kind of thing. Um, it makes releasing software much easier. Why? Because we're releasing software on a more frequent basis as opposed to once every six months or, one, or annually and so on. I don't know what your frequency of your software is, but that's the idea here. Um, so, um, Again, my agile practices, the team has been empowered um, to make decisions about what to do. So self-organizing is the collaborative practice that again, influenced this specific question. Um, and I feel much more committed, dedicated to the team and to the work. Again, this is a collaboration practice, peer programming. So that's where two people sit together. One person is the coder and the other person's called the navigator. So driver and navigator, navigator is thinking about what that person should write code on and then the other, per the other person's actually writing the code and then they switch roles. Um, again, the team is encouraged to be creative and to experiment with new ideas. Again, a self-organizing team practice. So you can see that everything that we found related to the self-organizing practice, that is the key here. So some, conclu some conclusions in this, this area, then I'll slightly change the topic a bit about experience and culture. So this is about satisfaction. So agile professionals are way more satisfied than plan driven. Uh, professionals and that's what our empirical evidence shows and the satisfaction correlates especially with collaborative practices and business influences so time to market these kinds of things that actually produce software much quicker that helps improve satisfaction on teams and then the questions around my agile around what people actually thought the technical practices that really reflects back onto the self-organization uh, component within agile 
So how much time do I have left? Okay, cool. All right. So I've got enough time to cover off a couple of different areas. So experience and culture. So now we're going to look at, so that was the main influences around Agile and how satisfaction affects um, software teams. Now I'm going to look at around how the experience of individuals actually affects the software development team and look at company culture. So the role of experience in Agile, so that it's about who the people are, what the people actually do and how people feel. And so the question is, you know, how does organizational experience with Agile and, and organizational culture affect what people do and feel. So if we look at this chart here, you can see based on the technical practices, so red represents non-agile and blue represents agile. And you can see here that these technical practices are things that also plan-driven development teams do, but also what agile teams do. And as you can see that people, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the experience, that agile teams were well more experienced with doing unit testing, coding standards, automated builds, continuous integration, refactoring, and so on. Um, even plan-driven teams did a little bit of um, peer programming. Collective code ownership wasn't um, very prevalent at all in non-agile teams. Um, but you can see that, you know, what uh, um, Agile introduces this thing called unit testing, where the software developer is writing small case uh, software tests about how the software executes, rather than wait to the end of user acceptance testing where you ship the code over the fence and you say, test is now test. This, this is a component where testing is involved from the software developer, where you're writing small unit-based uh, frameworks to actually test. For example, a lot of your software, or coders, as you say, um, you wanna test a different input. So does this input file work with the file format that I have? No, is there errors in my data? Of course there is. That's what unit testing is about. You're testing these kinds of things. So this was a super important. Um, coding standards, so what we mean by here is that everybody is adhering to the way that we name our classes or our interfaces or the names of our scripts or the things that we actually refer to. And this comes back to a lot of the domain concepts that you would be applying to in your fisheries area, but also some of the standards that are around programming languages and so on, and how you label code. Um, and then sort of some of the more automated things around automated builds, your, your code can build all the time very quickly and you're delivering code all the time. So some of the collaboration practices. So we see here again, uh, non-agile is red, agile is blue. That release planning was super important here. Likewise, iteration planning and user stories significantly higher than, than these other um, aspects. Um, and then in terms of group, group work, uh, daily stand-ups and retrospectives um, were important. Burn down charts are similar to Gantt-like charts, but they track exactly the progress that's going on. And then one of the other things that uh, software, uh, agile software development teams talks about is having the customer on site. That's somewhat difficult in a distributed team um, or if your customer's in another country, but the idea is that the customer actually comes on site and works with the software developers to actually fix up some of those small user changes that you actually want to do. So those, those um, were done by the individuals and then if we look at what the companies actually had to say, um, so this was done by the individual company person, and you can see that um, which things actually improved over time, and you can see that project management improved. Uh, where is that? Oh, that's a summary of that. Um, but this, so this is looking at the, the teams that said how Agile influences the company views on developing software based on experience. So project management is really important here. Time to market was really critical. Team morale was significantly better by de developing and, and uh, sorry, adopting agile practices and the IT business alignment. So aligning the, the goals of the software development team with what the business model was actually trying to achieve. So that's kind of what this is showing. Um, <clears throat> then we look at uh, something slightly different. This, this is looking at correlation, uh, co-occurrence heat maps by looking at how, okay, cool. Um, how experience affects the different professionals. And what you can see here, <clears throat> this is just a sample. This just shows you that um, if we look in blue, blue represents um, uh, more positive values, red's negative, so risk management wasn't so high. And the idea is we ask this kind of question and we ask you a set of the questions and we're trying to understand it based on the experience of the individual people. So what we show here, um, it, there's a chart that I'll show you in a second, but the idea here is that the practices at the top here were all the technical practices. And this is what, uh, uh, graduate or junior developers or coders would actually do, spend more time on. They were really focusing on the technical practices, but all the practices around collaboration and uh, group work um, were less effective. They were not very good at this in the first two years. They spent more time um, 
practicing the technical practices. And as people progress in their, their career, between two and five years, they started to actually accomplish and get better at the technical practices. But what you will see is that they started to adopt sort of some of more of the collaboration um, and team practices. So we can see that uh, iteration planning, user stories, daily stand up and, and, and so on. Some of the more agile practices were getting uh, well more adopted um, and were getting more effective. And that's probably because, you know, as students come out of the degrees and they have limited experience, they don't know how actually necessarily how to work with people. Once you've been in industry for a while, you're much better to be able to work with people, I think, anyway. Well, given that a lot of the people that come from my degree are very quieter individuals and not so vocal and not, don't have a lot of this, um, the social skills that many software companies, um, they're actually asking for. Um, and then if we look at um, more experienced professionals, so greater than five years, what you see here is that the agile practices around collaboration and so on um, are significantly more uh, well-developed. Things that still are not very good at is Kanban and actually test-driven design. These things were quite difficult, um, but it's a new process. If we look at it, compare it together, you can see here the flow. Oh, sorry, I was to use it later. You can see that the flow here is the technical practices are at the top. So the students will start, or well, the graduates starting to get pr proficiency at that. By the time they're mid-career, they're well proficient. By the time they're experienced, they're, uh, or five years greater, they're more, well more experienced with uh, sort of some of the more agile practices. Um, and then if we look at the influences by agile experience, um, so these are the business influences that you can see here. Um, so productivity, IT and business alignment, development processes, risk management, and again, similar kinds of ideas that eventually release management, which is this bottom one, is well more proficient than students or uh, graduates with less than two years experience. So that's the main thing. Um, so the last area around culture, around teams, is we looked at um, Schneider's model around how teams have different kinds of culture that affect the actual team. So there's uh, control, so that's more management, collaboration where teams are working collaboratively together, competence, actually understanding the technical practices and cultivating, actually encouraging teams to be more effective. So there's a sort of a chart you can look at on the website. And <clears throat> what we saw here is that um, professionals, um, you, I'm not sure if you can quite see that, but the blue, so these things here is uh, purple, which is the cultivation and uh, collaboration. These things were more important for the professionals um, and likewise, not as in, uh, they're, they're also important for the, the companies as well. So collaboration and cultivation. So that's what people perceived as, as what they were sort of going. Um, some of the barriers. So if we looked at the barriers that are preventing sort of some of these types of cultures. So in the, um, um, the, the, the individuals, the, the thing that was hard to change was someone with less than two years experience was changing the culture, organizational culture. And often what you see is a graduate student will stay at your organization for a couple of years and move because they get frustrated with the organizations. They can't change the culture. And that's the idea. Um, if we combine that together and we, so that this chart and this chart are the same, just the different grouping of the, the sections. And you can see again, um, being able to the ability to change is less than two years. So this is a really frustration for anybody, even whatever experience they're at. So it's hard. So introducing agile is not easy. Um, so I'll finish up in a second. Uh, so my agile, so these are the questions that we looked at again. These are the, the 12 um, questions that were there and they were like, I pay more attention to my code. Um, I write code with higher quality. I have less stress and so on. And uh, if we look here, um, the most important thing is that in the first two years, like this is what this is, two years, two to five and greater than five, is that most people are stressed by overtime um, and stressed by having too many hours to work. So that really affects those first uh, few years of development. And by the time you, you know, got five years, you, you're actually in a balanced position to be able to be more um, successful. Um, so let's I think this next now goes into something else, but I think I'm going to end based on time. Um, so let's just switch. I can't switch through this. So, um, so I guess in summary, um, we've been studying agile teams for about 15 plus years. We're probably the biggest research group in the world that's done this up here at Victoria. They wouldn't know that. We don't do a lot of stuff in New Zealand. Um, we do a lot of stuff overseas, studying teams and so on. And 
so the technical, so the summary is the technical practices precede collaborative practices. So the idea in your software teams is go back to your organization, see if you can focus more on those working together as a team rather than those very minute technical practices. Those will come with time. Um, the organizational culture is linked really to agile experience. You know, you have to think about how do you, can you change your culture so that it is more progressive and that really is useful if you help adopt agile practices. And the barriers are cultural first, so that's really difficult to change if your organization is not willing to change. And as we saw in the newspaper just recently in the last 12 months, many companies are now adopting agile practices or an agile mindset. And that's the idea that we encourage organizations to adopt. Adopting those technical practices takes a long, long time, but getting your company on board is important. And I guess the final comment is that agile is really stressful. Software development is stressful regardless. It's a very, um, not an easy process. Um, and self-organization is maybe the way that can actually help. So working to your teams to figure out what actually should happen and work together as a team. So your task for us is to uh, go and complete this agile study. Uh, so if you go to this webpage, swissagilestudy.ch, and tell us what you think. It takes about 17 minutes in software development. Uh, sorry, 17 minutes to complete the study. And we'd like to know how software development practices in your organizations are being applied. And we're doing a study all around the world. So we're taking the, what we've done with the Swiss Agile study for the last three or four times, and now going to be able to compare different countries and seeing how Agile affects different organizations and different countries and how that culture is affected. Um, with that, I think Jennifer and I are happy to take some questions. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. And um, any questions can be addressed to either both or uh, one specific speaker. Um, I usually don't do this. I don't like to take advantage of my position as chair to ask the first question, but in this case, I'm going to. Um, so we just went through a recent uh, project where we were developing a website uh, for our organization, and um, it was a complete failure. We got a professional team in to do it. And um, based on some of the things you said, I mean, the two th aspects of that that um, caused the problem was there was no really real owner of the project. And then the other thing is we never held to deadlines and to meeting schedules. And so I think that's two of the main region, reasons why it failed. Um, and we have this problem in our f field where the, everyone that's involved in this has other tasks. And so any project is stopping and starting. We don't, you know, we can't hold to schedules because we have to get something else finished and, and so on. So I was wondering if you had any uh, experience with that and advice on how to deal with those issues. Sure. Yeah, I can go. So, how, so you're all coders, right? So how many, so I, I guess a question could be a broadly applied. How many of you estimate how long th something's going to take? Put your hands up. And the, so the question I ask all of you in the room is, does, does your estimation skills get better over time? What's the answer? No. What? <laughs> Correct. It doesn't. Okay. That's why projects fail. So estimation is really critical. We can, we can estimate things that we've done before and we have a pretty good idea, but the problem with software is many things are unknown. And so the, that comes back to the agile component. Whereas if we're trying to estimate and have a large release in six months time, that's too long. It's not possible. The idea is do it in shorter releases. So estimate smaller chunks at a time. And as you said, context switching is really ch challenging. So you're switching between different tasks. So the idea is with one of the methods in Agile here is Kanban. We didn't go into detail about that, but the idea is that you only ever take on two tasks at once because after that, you can't take any more on. And so you should only finish that task before you move on to the next task. So estimate in smaller chunks have your iterations between being between one and four weeks. There's a company here in Wellington who do, who no longer ex exist, but they were called three months.com. And I'm not sure they were a couple of streets away. And the way that they worked is that they developed software on three month chunks. So organizations like yourself would go to them and say, can you build software? And they said, well, we can only do it for three months. Once you've done that three months, or then negotiate another three months. So that, so it's having a sh much smaller, cycle on, on what you would deliver. And I think that would certainly help. So smaller chunks is, 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 is pretty much the answer. Um, I would just say there are, um, there's a lot of work, like we had sort of alluded to during the presentations that you have to do with the wider business um, 
to sort of get them on board. So there's a lot of work around um, getting people to commit to schedules and regular meetings and so on. So that, that is very difficult to make sure that the Agile team uh, can run without delays. But then I think um, what sometimes happens when you have user experience designers and developers working together is, and I think this could apply in the case where software development might not be your main job, is to maybe set aside a day or a week, whatever you can get to negotiate with uh, the wider organization to just focus on development work, perhaps. Um, people do this so that, they, so that everyone can, can get together in one place and, and, and work together for a focused amount of time and then maybe do that regularly for a few months or so. Okay, any other questions? Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I, I have a mic, so I'm going to just start, <laughs> and then I'll give it to the guy in the green shirt in front of me. Um, this is totally compelling. You know, I feel like many of us are already doing these practices without really realizing it, but by having a name for it and a framework that we can do them much better. But I, I think a, a mismatch with sort of the typical software development world that you see is that for many of us, the coding we do, we're the only customer. It, it, you know, we're writing code to make our science work better. And then those of us who happen to be fortunate to work on projects where we're successful, then other people start adopting it. But we, we often de don't even know who the customers are. You know, I, I now work on a project that I talked about this morning, maybe you saw my talk, but where, you know, it's now been really widely used, but I, I you know, I get emails from people or even pull requests from people that, that I didn't even know they're out there using it. So how, you know, at, and then at the same time, you know, I work for the U.S. government and it's not necessarily our mandate to make life easier for somebody in a different country who chooses to, to use our software. So, so I'm curious if you could speak to sort of that developer customer interface in, in the weird world of scientific programming where you don't necessarily even know who your customer is. So I've got some first-hand experience with this, but I don't have a time to show you, but I'm happy to chat, chat to you afterwards. I've actually been working with NIWA up in Auckland and the air quality team, and we've been developing an environmental data science platform to understand how to air quality exists in the world. And so we developed an agile approach with just one student. NIWA was clearly the customer, the internal people, and we just broke it down into small iterations, and the student actually produced a relatively effective interface, and it's essentially taking some of the things that you guys are talking about, your R scripts and so on. Um, and someone talked about Shiny, I think I heard Plotly as well. So bringing those kind of components into a web-based tool to actually understand um, quality data. So we were the external developers, Niwa was the customers. There's no reason why Niwa couldn't do that themselves. Um, so I think one of the things that would help maybe your organization is to actually have a roadmap, make it publicly available, what's actually going into the releases. And as we see, one of the things is open source software. You talk about, ah, there's different packages like ggplot, these kinds of things. They actually specify and have a roadmap of where things are going. And I think that would certainly help. And then people could then push those pull requests and you can actually estimate when that should, those things could actually go into some of the, site, uh, the pipelines. There's an organization called Mozilla who write a web browser called Firefox. They, the first engineering office outside of New Zealand is based in Auckland and they adopt a pretty similar approach the studies that we've talked about here looked at only software organizations rather than open source organizations, which I think is where your approach is actually getting at. Um, but yeah, I think um, having a roadmap of where you're actually going. Okay, yeah. Um, and, and, and you know, put it on the wiki, right? Put it on the GitLab repository or the GitHub thing and, and let people know what's coming up. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think I was just asked to say my name. I'm Hilary Oliver from Niwa in Wellington. Um, so I, um, I, I think this is all uh, great stuff. I like the sound of it. I have a little bit of experience with, it, with Agile, but I think there might be a, an opening for some uh, research on how to apply it effectively in scientific software development <clears throat> uh, because it almost seems like a, a madman's dream to have the resources to do any of this uh, in, in my world, I think. Um, so I, I think uh, science is becoming more and more depend, dependent on software uh, and sometimes very critically dependent. But at the same time, the, the science funding system and, and even management and scientific institutes, don't, they, they haven't really kept up with that fact. And, um, uh, and, and another 
uh, aspect of it is the software collaborations that I've been involved in have been often very widely distributed. Like my main collaborators in the UK, uh, you know, diametrically opposite time zone. So regular stand-ups are impossible. <laughs> um, so it's, it's quite a, a challenge to figure out how to adopt any of these methods, I think, to, ma to make our lives easier. <clears throat> So do you have a question or do you want me to just comment? Oh, sorry, no, that's more of a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, but, okay, question is, um, and I don't expect to be able to answer it right now, but um, how, can we, <laughs> how can we use these um, uh, better um, software ma development and management techniques in, um, in the scientific environment? We, we typically do not have uh, teams co-located, in my experience anyway, um, <laughs> and resource to, to do this kind of thing and, and also with limited resources yeah, yeah. So, so i'm going to say i agree with you um, as a researchers that are studying software development that's one of the reasons why we were asked to which is one of the reasons why we wanted to come and talk to people with doing scientific computing to actually understand what you are doing and I, we think we, there's a good research project to understand best practices that we've studied with software teams to see how we can actually apply those with scientific organizations such as yourselves. And we've got, like I'm doing software development projects with scientific organizations at the moment, but we would love to take this, the kind of thing that we are doing and understand what you're doing. And I think and a quick answer now is probably not gonna satisfy your real response. Um, and I think that's probably working with you one-on-one -on -one to see where we could go with that. Um, but I think um, in particular trying the distributed model, I think there's tools like the GitHub, the GitLab, um, Zoom, but again, the time zone is a really critical thing. And I think having stuff that's dig uh, digitally enabled. So are you using tools like Jira issue tracking systems? Um, yes, I'm, I'm using most of the tools that you've mentioned already, but uh, still the, the actual um, in-person, there, seem, there seems to be a strong yeah. in-person yeah. uh, component to this. And that's virtually impossible. Yeah. And, and again, it comes back to what you were saying before, budget, right? So yeah. if, if one thing that's important with the agile space is face-to-face -face communication. So that might be the case of you actually fly to the UK or bring them here on the off season when wine and beer is good and sun, if it works in the UK, I don't know, but maybe um, that would be, you know, the, the main thing to do is, is have more regular face time um, with them. But in, Maybe you change the shift of your work time frame, but then if you've got family, that's difficult to do. But you maybe once a week or once a month, you meet up on a regular Skype is something to do. Um, but you need to allocate that. And so maybe if your hire is up, say, hey, well, I'm not coming to work until 12 o'clock because I have an eight o'clock, nine o'clock Skype call, right? That might be the thing to do. Um, that would be one thing. Um, but I think some of the distributed digital tools certainly help in that mechanism but you're never gonna have a, the time zone challenge. I don't have an answer, so. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, we're scheduled to go to lunch now, but uh, I think this is interesting. If you guys are okay with a shorter lunch break, um, that'd be great. Anyone that wants to leave is welcome to leave as well, um, but we'll continue going for a while to um, get some dis questions and discussion. And Matthew had a question. Uh, actually, I was just going to mention that we have a small development team, so we're mostly agile, but our uh, members usually take on a couple of roles in the process. It's kind of how we get over it. So some things kind of fall by the wayside. Okay, uh, Rick. So did, you, did you have a question? Oh, just a comment. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think one of the things, so Jennifer talked about team site, or oh, the team itself. So typically agile teams are seven plus or minus two. So, um, and the idea is what you're saying is some things fall on the wayside. So the idea with agile teams is that you actually have generalists in your team that can actually perform multiple functions. So that's actually fine what you're doing. So the idea is that the person can do the database, can do the UI, but that's not always the case. But the idea is to spread that knowledge amount among, among the team. That's the idea. Yeah, we have three. So. Yeah, we have a small team in our development effort and it's, it's small enough that we recently went through an exercise of evaluating whether or not to adopt Jarrett for our, our, our changes. And we in the end rejected it because 
we felt that the team members were diverse enough in their roles. We, we weren't uh, all doing the same activity. We were a team, but everybody had a separate role. And we in the end did not adopt Jarrett because we didn't feel as though we getting away from basically reviewing your own work and then passing it on to the person that needed to do associated work uh, was working for us. So we didn't feel as though Jarrett itself. So the, the question is, you know, when we have teams that are small, typically less than five, typically having some members that are distributed to alternative locations, hopefully not all the way halfway across the room. I mean, what are the, are there other resources um, or are there ways to adopt an agile approach that is gonna facilitate, you know, small teams like that that tend not to have, you know, a collection of five programmers who all can be interchangeable, but rather having a collection of five people who collectively provide the expertise that the whole team needs. Well, this, um, there is a lot of resources out there on distributed agile teams, and I can certainly um, share that with you if you're interested. Um, so what sometimes happens in the case where you have teams off site is that they might operate um, uh, their iterations and their planning sessions individually and then there might be um, a meetup of representatives from both sites who meet up, say, weekly to just coordinate between the two. So if they can operate independently, so maybe you can allocate tasks that are not dependent on each other and then they can sort of spin on their own but then synchronize up uh, at a separate, separate time. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's all about organizing time and when people meet and, and that sort of thing has to be worked out. And there are structures around that already that are in place that um, are well known in the agile space. Yeah, Patrick. Oh, can, I, can I add to your comment? So, so, um, so the question was, you know, if I adopt Jira, am I agile? That's pretty much what you're saying. And so one of the things that an agile says, it's not a silver bullet, right? It's not like, oh, well, let's just do agile. We're going to be amazing. It's not like that. And it's not like, hey, if I implement these five tools, I'm going to be agile. And so that's really the, the, the crux of the issue. Just because you adopt all these tools and you say, I'm doing agile, does it really mean you're agile? The answer is, it depends. So the, the, the crux is making your team work in agile mindset. Um, and so Jira is quite a heavyweight tool for um, agile. It's probably a lightweight tool compared to plan-driven development. But there are other tools that you could use, like Trello. Has people used Trello? Okay, I see a couple of hands. So T-R-E-L-L-O.com. They're actually now owned by Atlassian, who's the company that owns Jira based out of Sydney. So they're connected. And so it's a lightweight um, task management tool. For small teams, that tool's fantastic. Um, I would suggest you use that. Um, and um, the idea is because Agile says, here's all the things you can do, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do all of those things to be Agile. So taking what works in the Agile framework, because there's multiple methods, taking whatever those work to help you as your team, that's what's more critical than saying, hey, five things and those things, and yeah, I'm Agile, but it's... it's the question is, what are you delivering in terms of business value? And if those tools help you, then great. Then if not, then change to another tool. There are others out there. So I, I don't know if that helps. What Agile is all about is, uh, they like to say, fail early and fail often. So um, it's good to know what you can't do and then to switch and try something else as quickly as possible, not to waste time. Thanks. Yeah, Patrick? Okay, yeah, thanks for the, the overview. Um, what I... What I saw there uh, seemed like it was not, or didn't have to be specific to software development, but it's kind of project management in general, um, with the exception of things like unit testing and some of these other finer details. But, but to get at what kind of Mark's initial question, for people who code and develop, but it's just one small task within a much broader collection of things, could you just integrate the ideas of this into a larger project management approach um, so that it's just part, you know, it's a part of all the things you do so that you're not getting uh, 
kind of lost in going in one direction or another. And we use, uh, the, the group we have, we use Asana, which is another one of these software things. But, um, and we use it for everything like development, but also, you know, give a presentation on whatever, or write a paper or whatever, they're kind of all, all in there. Yeah, so, so I think there's two, you know, other methodologies that are more heavyweight that are in uh, other frameworks. A rational unified process is the traditional plan-driven approach, which is more waterfall. That's now sort of fallen from the wayside. But in terms of IT service management, there's frameworks called PRINCE2 and PMI. So PMI is very US driven. PRINCE2 is very driven from the UK government. And now they were both starting off in IT project management, but now they've been spread to other project management disciplines. And we're seeing the same recently with Agile. It's only really recently have been adopted by non-software organizations within the last 10 years, more so in the last five years, but some organizations have started in the last 10 years. So Spark put a new thing just this year saying, hey, we're going to go Agile, and then everybody's contract was shortened. So, um, so that's on a holistic approach. But the idea I think you were referring to is how is, can an individual be Agile? And so one of the things is for you is, I would suggest is, you know, you time box your uh, things that you're actually going to do over a one week period or a two week period or whatever you define as your sprint or iteration. They're the same thing. Sprint is the term used in the scrum methodology. Iteration is the word used um, to represent a sprint in the agile methods. So I'd suggest that you do something like that, specify the work tasks that you're going to do over that shorter period and see how that would integrate. And you're possibly already doing that, but putting it into more of a structured approach using tools maybe like Trello as an example and time boxing the event. So the idea is if the thing that you're working on takes more than two weeks, then that's clearly too long. Break that down into smaller tasks or as we refer to as user stories here, which has tasks that are involved. Um, that would be one thing to do. There's a specific um, thing that's aimed at individuals called personal Kanban. And if you Google that, you'll find a little task board management thing that you can sit on your desk, which is like a little bit of uh, pieces of paper. And it's developed by a lady called Sandy Mamoli, who's here in Wellington, who's in the Agile community. And it's something that you can stick on your desk that has a to-do thing, um, your backlog, like Jennifer was talking about, the tasks that you could stick in the, the idea and things that you're currently working on. So you take tasks from your backlog, put it in your to-do list. When you've done those, you put in the done thing. And the idea is you're only working on two to three tasks at once. So that would be what I would suggest. Okay, um, Bucky, you had a question? No. Okay. Um. Um, so this kind of follows up on what Patrick just said and also what I'm hearing. When I've worked where Agile has been very successful, um, you mentioned the short time frames uh, of having one to two weeks. It, it really helps with motivation of the team and the software. I think a lot of what happens in our groups is that it's not that the tasks themselves actually take longer than a week or two. You can't break them down smaller. It's that there's so much else going on that people can't, their timeline to be able to return the task is a longer period of time. And so it, stretch out, it stretches it out. You can't actually break it down more. So how would you handle just because everyone is overworked and has no resources, they're not gonna be able to return, you know, assign back that task in less than a month. So, so the idea is, you know, the other things that are non-software related, you add those into your workflow. So you estimate that time frame as well. So I don't know your organization, but I've worked in multi, multinational companies and, you know, every now and then it pops up, oh, you have to go and do this online training, which takes half a day or you need to go to this business corporate meeting. Yeah. Like you've got a buffer in those kinds of factors into your workflow process. So I suggest when you're estimating tasks, that you give yourself you know, a day's buffer of, of other crap to deal with. So it might be admin, it might be email, it might be you know, someone's morning tea for somebody's leaving, you know, that kind of thing. Those things people forget about putting it in when they're estimating how long things take. We talk to software developers all the time and um, they're, most of them are overconfident on how long things take. They say, oh yeah, that'll take me two days. <laughs> and the project manager goes, oh, the developer said it's gonna take me two days to do that. I, I believe that software developer is correct. <laughs> they are so wrong. And so the idea is you always need to add some buffer into the, to the, the process. Um, and that comes back to the question about estimation or well, how long does something actually take? So one thing you can do in that process is have three things. 
what's the ideal thing when you actually kind of think what would be actually good to actually have done it. So if that takes you three hours and you estimate it ideal time, three hours, best case might be done in one hour and the worst case, eight hours. And so then the idea is if you kept capturing that information on your tasks, you can go back into your retrospective of your reflection and go, Hey, well, that thing actually took that many hours. Um, let's come back and, and reflect on what we've done. And then we can estimate, much broader or holistic approach on how many things we can actually get done per week or per iteration or per two weeks, that kind of thing. So it sounds like maybe in your case that that's the kind of thing you need to do um, based on what you, uh, you're currently doing. I don't know. I'm just reading from the outside, but happy to follow on. Does that help or not? Um, I understand the concept of the time it takes, but it's, it's just more that there's a tendency to just not be able to physically, since we're not one team that works on one product and we are often not even actually on the same team, like you're interacting mm. with other teams effectively. It's just that that particular task, whether it takes three hours or not, it's not going to fit into a specific sprint, right? Yeah. It, and so you wind up waiting on someone else to return an assigned task to you many months down the road. Um, and you, we don't manage each other. You know, it's not like we tend not to have a scrum master who's outside of it who can say, you didn't bring this back to me. So it's not so much about the individual planning of time of things. It's that we have pieces that go out to people and you don't necessarily know when they're coming back. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll just say, so there are actually two ways of managing tasks in agile software development. Not that these are necessarily going to answer your problems, but just to think about. So the one is the time box iterations that we talked about. So your one to two weeks and then your bigger release of maybe six months. But then um, another thing, uh, and it looks similar to this, and, and Craig's already mentioned the Kanban model. Um, so instead of limiting your time, you can limit your work in progress. So, for instance, so it's just another way to think about organizing tasks is just where you've got these different states. You can say, okay, I have capacity to do three user stories under development. I can do four under testing and, and that's my, my work in progress limit. So then you start to work more towards the Kanban and the flow model of software development where um, you sort of they call it the pool model. So when a space in testing becomes available, so I've got capacity for four, but I've got three user stories at the moment. So now I can pull one that is ready to go from development into um, testing. So then you get away from this idea of, of how long is it taking me? You know, is it a week? Has it been two weeks? But you, you start to see sort of a flow start to develop so that you're getting sort of um, a continuous, uh, rate of completion. But we can, you know, we can talk about that more, it's a big area. Okay, uh, any other questions? So, I've got a question, so if you, if you Maybe want- I could add one more thing to that. <clears throat> so, one of the things in a sprint is, if you're telling sprint and not doing the Kanban flow is that a manager might come to you and say, hey, can you do this task? Does that happen? Yeah, so that happens, clearly. You've said yes, you've committed to that. So one of the things in a sprint is that you commit only to the things that you agree to up front in the sprint. You should not accept any more work in that entire sprint. And you just have to push back to your boss and say, hey, look, at the end of the sprint, yes, we're happy to add that into the, to the backlog, but we then need to prioritize that task to then schedule it and when we're going to do that. So, um, but that, I don't think that helps with your co coordination with your other person, but I think that the idea is to make sure that you only commit to those things in that one sprint and nothing else. Okay, so um, if, yeah, we, we've still got another quarter of an hour, you know, half an hour for lunch, Andre. Okay, uh, yeah, um, how do you, if you wanted to, to get into this agile management for your project, how would you go about it? I mean, you know, what, what are the steps you have to take and um, where would you get the information? So most organizations pay consultants <laughs> too much money. Um, there are a bunch of literature books that you could go away and look at. Um, so there's books on Scrum, there's um, agilealliance.org, 
um, extremeprogramming.org. Jennifer put a link to it on her slides. Um, so trying some of those things. Implementing some tools such as GitLab as an example, code repository. So if you're not putting your code into some shared repository, I suggest you do that like next week. That would be the first thing to tick. Um, and then sitting down with the team and, and coming up with a, a backlog of things to do, known as user stories. And that's something that you could sit down and work through and then scheduling some time boxes of when you're going to do stuff. I mean, those are pretty simple, like rudimentary things to do in Agile. And Jennifer had a slide which talks about getting started, so maybe. Yeah, um, just for resources as well, I would say the Agile Alliance is a good place to start. If you Google them, they have a lot of free resources on their sites. And then um, I guess my um, attempt here was to sort of, um, you know, I guess prompt thinking around, you know, where, where to start. So, um, I mean, Agile can be deceptively simple as well, but um, it does need a lot of work to actually get it going. So I would say I would start with these points and, um, you can pay consultants a lot of money or you could ask someone from the university <laughs> to, to help you as well. And that's my research area. So if you're interested. Yes, yeah, so, so I, th I think some simple tools would help using tools like Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O dot, dot com. Um, and talking to your customer, that's certainly important. And some of your internal people, um, sorry, some of you are working for internal groups. So actually talking to them about what they actually want it's really critical here and scheduling smaller steps of what's going on. You've already got frameworks of funding models and so on. And, I, and traditionally with the funding models as you specify a waterfall approach to the thing that they're looking for and they, you know, you have to put step one, step two and step three. But in reality, that doesn't happen like that. So if we knew what we were doing because we're researchers and we're scientists, we wouldn't be doing it, right? <laughs> and that's the problem. And the thing is you have to, with well, with our funding agencies that we apply for, that's the kind of thing they're looking for. What's the end goal? What's the end solution? You don't know that. So a lot of the research that we do is very serendipitous. So we have an open-ended questions. But I think with some of the organizations that you're doing, um, the, the, the components that you're actually de developing are a bit more um, constrained, are a bit more defined, but still you're not sure what that end outcome is. And I heard somebody earlier saying, well, do we need a GUI on that? Or maybe we don't need a GUI but maybe you need to define and describe that up front if that's something that you want to do. So I think a little bit of planning with the team and the customer at once would be the first major step here. Um, and that's pretty much leads to that first point there, getting a product owner. So um, a couple other points on questions. Um, so the first is, so for these software products that are available, um, Presumably, they're good things to use because they force you into following the agile or guide you along in following the agile approach because you're using the software. Um, I can't remember what the other question was, but <laughs> I think I think um, the tools uh, are not going to force you into those. I think that's the I think that's the assumption a lot of people make and then fall into that trap of thinking if we can just get the right tool, we're going to follow agile. No, it starts with the people and mapping out the processes without tools. Agile is surprisingly agnostic in terms of tools. These things that we mention are things that people have found useful through you know, years and years of practice. So it's not that one team is su successful with JIRA and another team is, is um, gonna adopt that and, and automatically be successful. I think that's a trap. Um, I've seen an organization where they use JIRA for the backlog, but they open up the backlog to the whole organization to add requirements. And um, there's no one person who is sort of protecting the team from that. And um, that leads to a massive mess and people don't know what they're working on and what the prioritization is. And so, yeah, I would be careful. Okay, I remember the other question I had. Okay, so what about a specification document? So, so basically we have this project we want to do, we want to create this general model for doing stock assessments. Um, and somehow we have to explain what it is, what we want and stuff like that. I didn't notice anywhere in here where you were talking about writing down the actual specifications of the project or the tool or whatever you're constructing. 
And so how does that fit into the agile process? Jennifer has actually got a slide for that. <laughs> Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think, you know, if you look on the right, that's what you want, right? So um, this is typically how software is developed and you design one feature and then you add another feature on top of that. But what uh, Agile talks about is something called a minimal viable product, MVP. You might've heard of that in the business context. So the idea is what's the most simplest thing that you could possibly do to make that work? And so start off with that. And so this would be essentially one user story, which might be draw the sketch of Mona Lisa. The second one is uh, put a little bit more detail around the back and some color scheme in. And then the third one is actually polish off the, that, 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 the, um, the actual picture. So smaller chunks. And so um, one of the things with, with software code is, is you can't do the database, the, front, the middle layer and the front end all at once. So you would might just focus on the UI and then you'd have stubs that would talk to the database. That would be your first sprint. The second sprint might be to work on the logic in the middle and that would then help build upon this, but it might not be um, exactly what you want. Um, so the idea is to create a flow of a, a simple skeleton of how this, the, the, the user software that we actually write would actually work. So you've got this large piece of project, break it down into smaller sections and say at the end of that user story, um, it comes back to the original question about documentation. Um, how much time should we spend on documentation? The idea is to get working software more quickly, more readily. So the idea is, even though you have this large specification, you're probably never gonna to get to the final Mona Lisa picture because that was like eight years or something for Da Vinci. So where do you stop along the process? And the, the fact is, if you stop here at stage two and that's three years, you've only got half the Mona Lisa. Whereas if we stop here after three years or some, some multiple there, then you've got actually a reasonable outline of what the product would look like. So that's what I would suggest. So, so something here that, that might, I don't know if it's related to all software projects, but it's to ours, is that um, if we get the un underlying architecture wrong, later on down the road, we may not be able to implement what we want. So if we, if we go ahead and we just want to produce something, because that's basically what we do. We're all basically producing something quickly because we have to get an assessment done. But then a little bit down the road, we want uh, something else included in the assessment. We go back to our code and say, oh no, I forgot to put that data structure in. I have to start from scratch because I can't fit that data structure in my underlying architecture. And that's kind of where we are at the moment. We're, we've been discussing what are the, I guess it might've been, what is the minimum, I mean, the, what is the minimum architecture that we need to be able to do everything we want in, in sort of like a 10 year, 20 year time frame. Yeah, that's too long. <laughs> Some of you will be retired or dead even then, you know, who knows, right? So um, the idea is that with Agile is that, that the designs change over time. You don't, so with plan driven approaches, you have a big architecture up front. But the idea of Agile is that architecture evolves over time. We don't know what that would be. So that's actually fine. So we change the stories as we go through the process and the ch stories that we have in the backlog, they may actually will be updated based on what you've done at the very beginning. And so the idea is that the architecture will change, but the, the thing is having an adaptable architecture. So if you have a database, for example, that needs to have unstructured data versus structured data, you actually have a user story that would actually support that and you could actually switch that in if need be. Um, I, I, I've seen that on many occasions. A recent project I was working on was looking at trying to introduce ontologies and structured databases um, an unstructured database. In the end, we went for a database called Mongo, MongoDB, which means you can just pretty much put anything in the system and that's what we wanted. But there was a lot of arguments about what the database should be and that just took too long. So the idea is to start off with a simple case, let's just get it running. And that can change, that's actually okay to, to change. And the fact is if you're trying to schedule 10 years out, I think that's probably the wrong way to think about it. And that's then trying to change the organizational culture to say, hey, we don't know what we want. and 
Um, if you look at big IT systems here, like for instance, uh, here in New Zealand, more recently is the teaching payment systems for school children, oh, sorry, school teachers, which was done by an organization called NovoPay, who are based out of Melbourne, but they actually produced the wrong software that ended up paying the wrong people the wrong amount of money. Datacom, who are just down here on Abel Smith Street, actually were the, the original vendors, and they switched the, the, the two systems in and out. And the idea is that project took too long to, to build. They didn't do enough testing. And so I think that would help to ratify the architectural designs that you actually make. So doing more testing about the design of the architecture would, would help so that you have the ability to change. The cost of change, as you've mentioned, if, you cost, if you're making the change much later in the piece, that's more expensive for your project. So having the ability to change is what Agile does here. And if we look precisely at this picture here, you can see, right? So in stage one here, I've already de determined what the design and the color scheme of Mona Lisa is going to be. So I have to stick with that from year one to year three. But in this picture here, I can actually change it after year two, whatever that final color scheme is gonna be. So that's the idea is we have the ability to change in a much frequent basis. And obviously that's easy to say, much harder to put in practice, I get it. And it's all about the refactoring. So soft, um, agile software developers might make something quick and dirty for the first iteration, but then we build in some time over the next iterations to refactor that code. It's actually built in. And that's the, the point at which you're paying, let's say, or paying the cost of, um, um, you know, investing more time and, and resources into getting a good design, which if you don't do, you're going to pay later at the end and it's going to be much more painful. So the idea is to do it along with the development. And on the first day, I was here for the, co for the talk um, about software engineering by, I think it was Matthew. Um, yes, and he mentioned extensible code and, and that's what you're aiming for, is this code that's easy to, to modify. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I think we should break. We've got half an hour for, for lunch now. So there's, there's a place just next door. So if you need to get to lunch, it's pretty quick and easy. Um, and we have a discussion period later at the end of the day. So we can continue talking about this. And we've got a couple of other presentations about projects and project management. So hopefully you guys can stay around and, and listen. Thanks.